Good evening, church family. It's good to see you tonight. If you're a guest here tonight, thank you for being here. We're glad you're here, and thank you for coming. Just a couple of things in the way of announcement. First of all, a week from tonight, next Wednesday, is a big event, several big events in the life of our church. First of all, Riverbend Academy begins its 22nd year, first day of classes next Wednesday. Amazing. And then also next Wednesday night, our fellowship suppers begin again in the fellowship hall. Come early. Excellent food, very reasonable prices, great fellowship. And we, that all begins next uh, Wednesday night. And that starts at 4.30 and goes until 6 o'clock. And then next Wednesday night also, three of our worship music teams begin. First of all, One Voice, which is for our children. And uh, there's training in music and musicianship and theology. We have great qualified, trained teachers, but we're lacking two helpers. Uh, you don't have to be musically trained. You don't have to... Um, really do anything other than just be a help to the teachers that are in the room, but we really do need two helpers. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in doing, here's what you need to do. Tonight, right after church, go to the choir room right behind this wall here. Kristen Grinnell is going to be running a meeting tonight, just kind of getting some strategies as we begin next week. Just walk up to her and say, I would like to see about helping. She will be glad to see you, I promise. And then also Youth Choir, Cornerstone Choir, begins next week. Uh, they meet in the choir room. I believe it's 5 o'clock. And then after church on Wednesday nights, we begin resume rehearsals with uh, the Riverbend Worship Choir, our adults. And uh, if you've ever had a desire to be a part of that ministry, I'd love to talk to you tonight after church and encourage you to come. There's no audition. Uh, you just need to love the Lord, love to sing, and come. Be faithful. And then this next week begins our fourth year of the Christ Theological Seminary. And that also is just hard to believe in how God has blessed this ministry. And for a smaller seminary, it's incredible the level of instruction. And um, I'm so, so proud of our seminary and the young men that are in it that are just growing in the Lord, being prepared for ministry. But if you want to be a part of that in just auditing a class, we have made arrangements for that, and we encourage you to look into that. So that starts this Saturday for the Saturday classes, and then next Tuesday for the Tuesday-Thursday sequence. Uh, just call the church office if you're interested. And then lastly, Soul Care. Our ladies has start, have started up recently, and men will be starting a new season very soon. And if you have not done Soul Care yet, I'd really encourage you to be a part of that. It's an important part of the discipleship that's taking place in the life of our church. And there's a table right through these doors in the back corner there that you can sign up and get more information. So these are all very important things coming up uh, in the life of our church. As we turn to scripture, let me read tonight from Hebrews chapter 13, and beginning in verse five. And it says this, be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this time together tonight. Father, thank you for all these ministries in our church. Father, we desire to be a church that's growing in the Lord, that's discipling, that's honoring the Lord Jesus Christ and all that we do. And so, Father, now as we lift our voices and sing, us, sing in worship and give you the praise that you deserve, lead us, guide us, help us. And then, Father, as your word is proclaimed tonight, be with Pastor Scott, help us to receive and obey and learn tonight from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Rick. What a great word to be content in Christ. Oh, it's so good to see you, church family. Why don't you stand to your feet and let's worship together. against the 
Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of light has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man, in his lips. Christ the Lord upon the tree, in the stead of ruined sinners, hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to You may be seated. Well, those are some good songs. Good to see you out here tonight. I know that there's probably many online right now. We've still got some sickness going on, but some are returning. Some have gotten better and returned, and some are still struggling along. We want you to know we're praying for you as you recover. We want you to trust the Lord, uh, but we do want you to know we're praying for you. As you go through it, we understand. Uh, many of us have been sick as well and went through that two weeks of feeling pretty bad. And uh, so we love you and we sympathize with you. I want you to get better. Well, let's pray and then we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 4. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the fullness of, of the scriptures. It's plenty. There's nothing lacking. We don't need to add to it. There's... There's a lifetime, of eternity of understanding you just found in this book alone, Lord. We thank you that you inspired it, every word of it. We can trust it. We can believe it. We can live according to it. Thank you that we can sing truth from it as well as we've done tonight. It encourages our heart to sing truth in a world of falsehood. And so, Lord, I pray that those songs would resonate in our hearts and minds. We would sing them throughout the days. 
And as we long for your return, may we be joyfully awaiting and serving you. Lord, thanks for our children down the hall and those who are teaching them. Please bless them, Lord, and may they learn great things about you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be in Leviticus chapter 4, but I want to start in Romans 8, just real briefly. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 8 with me, and then we'll come back and look at the law of the sin offering. But I was thinking about this first couple of verses in Romans 8, and it caught my attention in my study. And we all know how Romans 8 begins. Uh, it's a precious passage to us. We, we love every aspect of Romans 8. But we know that there is now, right now, present tense in your life, if you know Jesus, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful thing. But verse 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ. There's a law to that. The spirit of Christ, the spirit of life in Christ, has the ability, because of his perfect offering of himself, notice this, has set you free from the law. The law has its own. Another aspect of the law is sin and death, where the rages of sin is death. So this law of Christ has the ability to set you free from the law of sin and death. But notice verse 3. Here's what I'm after. For what the law could not do. We're going to look at the law tonight. We're going to look at the uh, sin offering, particularly in chapter 4 of Leviticus. Weak as it was through the flesh. Now, that, that, what that tells us is the law was not weak. <laughs> the law was a perfect standard of God. It reflects the character of God. Our flesh is weak. <laughs> we ourselves cannot keep it. If, if you could live perfectly, according to God's standards, you could get yourself into heaven. But no one can do that except one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he came, said, I came to not, to not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So here we realize that the law is weak because it's based on, based on us, we can't keep it. So what does God do? How does God fulfill this? Well, he sends his own son, now look at this, in the likeness of sinful flesh, like us, right? He was born of a virgin. He was born under the law, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And now look at this phrase, as an offering for sin. Now we're going to talk about the sin offering of the Old Testament tonight. But he becomes, and remember, everything's looking towards this. He becomes that very sin offering. And he condemns sin in his perfect flesh. So he hangs on that cross in his own flesh to condemn sin. He is that final sin offering. And that's, that's the title of the sermon tonight. Christ, the final sin offering. Now, if you come across that phrase you're going to go, well, well, it's a sin offering. And so then we go back to Leviticus. We back up to find out what the original sin offering was. And then as we go through this, we'll see how Christ fulfills it. But I gave you a little sneak peek there in Romans 8. What a great passage to open that up. Now turn back to Leviticus chapter 4. And let's begin to look at the law of the sin offering. Five thoughts here this morning. First, or this evening. First, just the explanation of the sin offering. Look with me at Leviticus chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Then, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, so it's a direct revelation. Moses is to say these things. This is God speaking through Moses here. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, and commits any of them. Now we'll stop right there because we'll get into the next section in a moment. So, here comes a sin offering. Now, well, probably when you hear the term sin offering, you may want to think about atonement, the sin of atonement. But this sin offering is interesting. The purpose of the sin offering was not for some accidental sin or for outright rebellion. This is interesting. Though. As soon as we hear the word sin offering, you're thinking, okay, this, if they, if this is the to wash their sins away, to use at least atone for a year. That's not what was the purpose of this. The sacrifice was more designed for those who live in general obedience to God, but because of their fallen human nature, their, their fallen human disposition, they fail at times to live up to God's standard. So this isn't, this isn't the day of atonement. We're going to get into that in Leviticus chapter 17. This when he says unintentionally, means as one who believes in God, an Israelite who believed in God, who was following God, but yet 
understands that he has not lived up or she has not lived up to the standards of God, had got wayward in her, his or her thinking or living, this is an offering for that. It's an interesting offering, isn't it? Now, there's a great contrast to unintentional sin, um, and there was a severe consequence for defiant sin. And so I want to make sure you understand that this is not for defiant sin. This listen, Numbers, he deals with defiant, what we call rebellious sin. Numbers chapter 15, verse 28 and following. The priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who goes astray when he sins unintentionally. That's what we're talking about in this passage. The sin offering is for unintentional sin. He goes astray. He's not doing what he knows he should or she should be doing here. Making atonement for him that he may be forgiven. Now, you shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is a native among the sons of Israel, and for an alien who sojourns among them. But the person who does not, excuse me, for, but for the person who does anything defiantly. So there's the rebellion, right? Listen to, the, listen to what the law said. Whether he is a native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. Ooh. So, in the Old Testament, and, and, and I'm very grateful for the New Covenant, defiance against God was to be cut off. You want to often wonder, you read the law and you go, if a child, if a child um, strikes his parents or, or tells them they hate them or whatever, there's several different things in there, the Bible says they should just be stoned. God has very heavy penalties for rebellion. And I don't think that's changed with God. But particularly under the law, there was, there was strict cut off from the presence, from the family of God being a nation of Israel at this point. The word defiance in this Numbers text, the Hebrew word describes it as, um, we get the word high-handed from it. Uh, maybe we would say in our day that you shook your fist at God. So that person's cut off. Because what God is saying, their heart has been revealed. They have no desire for me. They hate me. They reject me completely. And so as we look at the sin offering, that's not what this offering's about. And one of the things I really started enjoying about this study as I got into this deeper and deeper, I thought, wow, I really like this offering. The Lord knows that as Christians, and I was thinking of a New Testament you know, or New Covenant type of thing, he knows that we go astray at, from time to time, and maybe more often than we want to admit and he has provided a sacrifice for us through Jesus Christ for those sins. This is what this begins to fall under. Now, and again, certainly we love the new covenant that all sins can be atoned for, right? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? To forgive us of our sins. And to cleanse us from how much of that unrighteousness? Yeah, see, that's, isn't that a great statement? Because I want us to understand, yes, there's probably some of us that shook our fist at God at one point, and he saved us despite that. But yet, when we get to this, this sin offering, one who shakes their fist in God and under the old covenant, they were cut off. Now, we see a little bit of that in the New Testament and the New Covenant. If we go on, and if you continue to shake your fist at God, 1 John 1.10 says, if we say we have no sin, if you just, oh God, it's all your fault... 1 John 1.10 says, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us and we're dead. We're going to die. We're going to fall and die in sin. So it's still there in a sense when we think about defiant sin. Now, notice in verse 2, this is the first place that, that we find sin appear in the book of Leviticus. We've gone through three chapters. We've been through peace offerings um, and so forth, burnt offerings and so forth. But this is the first time he's actually used sin. If a person sins unintentionally. And, and so he, he uses a very common word here. It's a Hebrew word that we clarify that, that means missing the mark. Um, and, and here he's talking about missing the mark in an undefiant way, an unintentional way. You just have not been living, and I don't want to decrease that. You have not been living the way God would want you to live. So the word gives an understanding to the aspect of sin as we look at this, that one is in danger. And here, here's what I think the problem with unintentional sin, the way it's dealt with here, it's taking sin lightly. 
This is really what the sacrifice is about. You took the commandments of God as an Israelite. You did not take them lightly. So you very, you varied away. You drifted away from where God would want you to be. Now, come on. You know I'm talking to all of us too, right? I mean, but we understand this in Christ. We understand the fulfillment of this. There are times we do not live at the standard of what God has done. We have not let the motivation of the cross of Christ be our motivator to say no to sin, and we've given in on areas. And so as I studied this great offering, I, I was really encouraged to see the grace of God, how he allows sinners to come to him. Now, unintentional sin is the result of a poor view of God, isn't it? At least for a moment. At least for a moment, my unintentional sin is because I moved away from correct thinking about God. And for a moment or two or a day or a week or whatever that may be that we struggle with sin, I became more captured with my needs, what I feel, my felt needs, what my problems are, and that led me into this, what we would call undefiant sin, but in other words, missing the mark what God has for us. And so God always is in view when you study the law because he's the perfect character and he wants, he wants the nation of Israel to understand. And so he says over and over and over, do not forget I brought you out of Egypt. Do not forget I brought you out of slavery. Do not forget what I have done for you. And what do they do every time they sin? They forgot what God did for them. What do we do when we sin? We forget Christ died for us, at least for a moment. And we choose to sin. So this is an excellent study that helps us understand this. And listen, we, we know that our sin flows from a heart issue, right? We know that the things that come out of us are coming out of our heart. And so we need to surrender our heart, surrender the idols of our heart that lay on there, that push us into areas of displacency of, of loving the Lord. And, and then... You know, on the other end of it, I got thinking about this. You know, depravity just captures the will of man. And so what's going to happen is if you don't love the Lord, you're going to end up in complete rebellion against God and then follow his judgment. And that's exactly what happened to Israel. There was a remnant that honored God and loved God and, and kept the commandments using the grace of the sacrifices to walk with God. And then there's a large portion of Israel, as time goes on, that just completely reject him. And they all go to judgment and they die. And that's what happens today. People reject Christ. They reject the, the great offering of Jesus Christ. Their depravity does not allow them uh, to, uh, on their own to follow the Lord. They reject him and off they go into judgment. I was reading from a little prayer book. I think it was an Anglican prayer book um, that somebody posted. Um, and it, it was from many, many years ago. But he, it was addressing, the prayer was addressing unintentional sins in our lives. And, and he wrote, whoever wrote it wrote this, said, Lord, may it please thee to give us true repentance, to forgive us of our sins, our negligence, our ignorance, and endow us with the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, now listen to this, according to the word of God, according to thy word of God, it's old English. So here, even in this prayer book, which of course is not scripture, but it's somebody who's writing from the means of scriptures, says, Lord, please forgive us of our sins, even our negligence. When I'm negligent, I, I didn't go to you when I should have. I went to my own resources. I went to my own human wisdom. I went to my friends instead of you. Whatever the issue is, I was negligent in coming to the word of God to coming to hear what you told me to do. And the Bible says that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And so in this prayer, it says, endow us with the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend, to correct, make a course correction according to the word of God. Really like that. So Leviticus 2 discusses how God desires a sacrifice for un unintentional sin. And it's in what we're going to see in the next four points is it's everyone from the priests to the whole nation to the leaders until the, to the individual Israelite. First, let's look at number two, the sin offered um, a sin offering for the priest. I'm not going to read all these verses. Um, they are, there are some repetition in them, but my goal here is to show you each section and how they're different, right? 
So here in chapter 4, verse 3, I'll just read the first one. If an anointed priest sins so as to bring guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord a bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. So right now we know we've moved into a unique group when you study this. You begin to understand he's now talking about the priesthood. And the sin offering for the priest, they were to bring, notice in this verse 3, they're to bring a bull sacrifice on their behalf. Now right there we know something's different because they're bringing a bull and not a lamb or goat. So God is doing something different. And what he is doing here is trying to show that the priest here, that they are to identify with this innocent victim, this bull, by laying their hands on his head. You'll see that in verse 4. He shall bring the bull to the doorway of the tent of the meeting before the Lord, and he shall lay his hands on the head of the bull and, the, and, the, and, and slay the bull before the Lord. So what I believe the word of God is recording here is a sacrifice for priests because there's a greater sense of responsibility. There's, there's, a, there's actually a greater offering in a lot of ways. And you say, how, how is that? Well, a bull in, in any time of life is more expensive than other things, right? I mean, he's going to produce many offspring. You know, we would have bulls on the ranch and they would have offspring and their offspring would have offspring and we could follow the genetic line of that bull and they're very valuable. We pay a lot of money for good bulls because they last long. Same was true in this day. To, to offer a bull to the Lord was a very expensive proposition. And when you read, like we looked at last week where, um, was it Hezekiah offered a thousand bulls? You know, we, we had a bull for every 20 to 30 mama cows. You can imagine how, many, how much cattle come with a herd like that of bulls. And, and so it, what it shows is there was a sense, really a sense of responsibility of these leaders, these priests that were before the Lord. And, and, and back in verse 1, uh, excuse me, back in verse 3, there, there's this idea that this is to be brought before the Lord and it's to be um, public. They're to see this happen. Now, this is not far from the New Testament in some ways. James chapter 3, verse 1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing as to such we will incur a stricter judgment. You know, when we talk to young guys, older guys who are desiring eldership, desiring to go in the ministry, you know, we have a process because we want to make sure that this is of God and not of them. There is a stricter judgment that comes in. Discipline comes quickly to leadership. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20 says, those who continue in sin, these leaders, he's talking about elders, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest of them will be fearful of sinning. So here when we get to this passage, we see this priest now given um, orders of how to, um, in a sense, atone for these sins, these unintentional sins. Now, the phrase laying on a hands is used repeatedly through this passage. I think it's used... 5 times 4, 15, 24, 29, and 33. In every one of these cases, they're to lay hands on. And, and there's a real significance, clear, clear teaching here. It was the idea of, of um, identifying with this innocent animal that it is going to be your substitute. Well, I had the joy of reading Spurgeon on this passage um, this week. And let me just read you some of his thoughts on it. I can't say them any better, so I'll read them. He explains the symbolic, the symbolic behavior of this. He said, when, he lay, when you lay hands on this animal, here comes Spurgeon, it was a confession of sin, a consent to the plan of a substitute. You're consenting to that. I like that word. Lord, there's no way I can do this on my own, so I'm consenting to your plan as a substitute. This is what we do when we get saved, don't we? It was an acceptance of the victim in the sinner's place. While believing the transference of sin, it was a dependence and a leaning on this innocent substitute on your behalf. Spurgeon went on to say this. He said, there was a simplicity to the symbol, symbolic laying on of hands. There was no preparatory ceremony. There was to be nothing in the hand of the one sacrificing there was nothing to be done in the, with the hand of, of um, expectation of laying on the hands of the innocent animal. And there was nothing to be done to the hand of the one sacrificing. He doesn't get slapped or his hand cut off or anything. 
everything comes down to the symbol of identifying that this animal is going to take my place because the wages of sin is death. And I put my hands on it. Spurgeon's thoughts about the choice of a young bull and its role in Israel society, he turned them quickly to Christ as he read the sermon. He said this, Our Lord Jesus Christ is like the first lean of the bull, the most precious thing in heaven, the strong of the service, docile in obedience, one who was willing to and able to labor for our sakes. And it was brought, excuse me, and he was brought as a perfect victim through spot, um, without spot and blemish to suffer instead. Now, there's, some, there's certain things that he said, if you were on my ranch and thought you were going to lay a hand on my bulls, you'd probably be the last hand you're going to lay on anything because uh, they're going to run you over. Um, but not in the days of Israelite. These bulls were often oxen. They were used to pull carts. They were used to farm with. They were very, uh, very gentle. In fact, the law goes on to say if, you're, if your bull or your oxen gored somebody, that bull's got to die. Right? And then you've got to repay and you've got to make restitution of all of that because that was not the point. And so Spurgeon takes that idea and says, um, using the bull, the first thing of the, the first lean of the bull, Jesus Christ is the, the, the son of the God, the, fir, the, the, um, the only begotten, full of grace and mercy, strong for service. Boy, have you ever, have you ever had to wrestle bulls? I mean, they are not fun. I mean, we've had rank ones. We had to rope them, try to get them into trailers out in the middle of the desert. You got guys with five ropes on these things, and there's this 2,000 pound bulls just pulling your horses around. They'll do whatever they want once they figure that out. But not, but not our Lord. Our Lord was strong, right? He could call 10,000 angels, he could, he could do all of that, and yet he, he, he was docile in obedience. I mean, if I was an angel, I would have said, Go get them. <laughs> you know, get off that cross and wipe them all out, right? But not our Lord, right? He was docile in obedience. He came like a lamb um, led to slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. Spurgeon said this, one who was willing and able to labor for our sake. See, the oxen, the bull in that dime, he would labor hour after hour plowing a field. It was said in those days they could really, with the best oxen, could do 20 acres. That's all they could really farm. With a couple of sets and a couple of sons working, you can maybe do 40 acres to keep maintain growing grain in them year round. But that took a great deal of strength and oxen that would pull plows. There was no tractors, as you know. But they labored. And Christ labored for us. What a labor. We sing that one song where he steps out of the air, he, he quits the breathing the air of heaven and steps to breathe the dust of earth. I mean, just think about that. How the Lord came down and humbled himself to that. But yet, he was the perfect victim. And in a sense, our sins were laid on him who was spotless and unblemished. What, what a great teaching this is. Well, look at verses 5 through 7 as we go on with the priest. Then the anointed priest is to take some of the blood of the bull and bring it into the tent of meetings. And the priest should dip, shall dip his fingers in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest also shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of the fragrant incense, which is before the Lord in the tent of meetings. And all the blood of the bull of the bull shall be poured out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering. This is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Now, one of the other interesting instructions about this sacrifice of unintentional sin for the priest was that they were to take some of the blood and bring it right into the tabernacle. And they were to sprinkle it seven times before the Lord right in front of the veil. So they're inside the holy place. Not in the holy of holies, but they're inside the holy place. This priest is to bring the blood of a bull for his unintentional sins into that holy place. And then the rest of it is to be put on the horns of the altar um, of incense that would be burning constantly before the Lord. And the rest of it poured out around the altar of the burn the burnt offering. Now, clearly, sin is an offense against a holy God, and this is what we begin to see here. And bringing a blood sacrifice in before the veil, it recognized that God was present. He sees not only the sin, but he also sees the offering. Now, remember, this is unique to this sin of this priest here. Now, this shows, I think, the seriousness of even unintentional sin 
of priest, of the leadership here, particularly the spiritual leadership. There's a difference. He's going to talk about leadership of the nation, but here he's talking about the spiritual leadership of the nation. It is very serious to God. Even though it is intentional, the Lord takes it very serious. Notice he uses the word seven times, again, a, a, a number that often reflects perfection in the scriptures. And this repetition of seven times is found um, in the Day of Atonement, it's found for purification of leopards, it's found for the dedication of the altars. We find this word this seven times often. But the blood of the altar on the incense, the, the altar of incense there, this fragrant incense that's burning 24-7 in there before God, was most likely to reflect their prayers before God. And, and so God wants the priest to understand that I don't want your prayers inhibited because of your unintentional sin. And so blood is brought into the holy place. It's sprinkled before the veil, but it's also sprinkled on this altar of incense. It reminds them that God hears their prayers and is there watching and listening to them. <laughs> you study this and you go, he's very serious about leadership. It's particularly spiritual leadership of the nation. When the spiritual leadership of the priest went, the nation went right with it. And you can see him weigh on them for this. Now, the altar of burnt offering, which would have been outside just by the door to the tent of meetings, um, was a place that the atonement and the rest of the blood was poured out around its base. And, and there on that, he would take the fat. You can read down through here. They would take the fat of this bull and they would offer it up and the fire would burn it and the smoke would go up as an offering to the Lord. But then the hide and the flesh and everything else, all the meat, all of it, nothing was to go to the priest. Nothing was to be um, um, given to the, to the one offering the sacrifice. All of it, skin, hide, entrails, all of it was to be removed um, and taken out and burned. Now, what that means, and here's what I think why it was done, because that's not always done for the rest of these sacrifices, is that it was to remove all selfish motives that, that maybe the sin offering would maybe create in somebody. That if the priest brought the offering, the whole offering had to be destroyed. There was nothing there left of it was to be completely consumed by fire. And if the Israelite brought the offering, the priest could eat it. So, with the, so it, it, we'll see that here in a moment. So the priest brings this offering, everything's destroyed. If the Israelite brings it, the priest can eat some of it. And I'll explain why that is as we go down through it. But I think God was displaying that the sin offering could not be used for nourishment here or anything else. Because the main purpose was offering to be right with God. God wanted those priests right with him so they could enter into his presence and there was to be no benefit to their sin. See, if you get to eat part of that animal, there's a benefit to it. At least I got a nice steak out of it, right? Um, there's to be no benefit of this for the priesthood. They are to burn it all. Well, Paul says very similar things, doesn't he? In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, those I have kind of lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. You know, what the temptation was, you can say, well, look at me now. You know, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I think this is where the prosperity gospel goes. Okay, Jesus, we believe in you. Now you owe us something. No, we didn't owe you anything. I mean, the greatest gift we ever have is our sins are completely forgiven. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because he's been the sin offering. And so Paul rehearses that. He goes, look, the only thing I want to be found in is not my own righteousness derived from the law, verse 9, but being found in the righteousness of Christ. This is what his, his whole lesson is in Philippians chapter 3. Now, let's move on. Third, the sin offering for the nation. So he explains the sin offering. It's unintentional sin. Then he goes to the sin offering for the priest. Now he's going for the whole nation. Now, you, you have to understand this is different because we're going to have the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 17, and that's for the whole nation. So this, there must be something unique about this. Why they have a sin offering for the nation that is for unintentional sin. Look with me at verses 13 and 14. Now, if the whole congregation of Israel commits error, and the matter escapes the notice of the assembly, and they commit any of the things which the Lord has commanded them not to be done, and they become, and they become guilty... When the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a bull of the herd for a sin offering and bring it before the tent of meetings. Well, everything seems to be the same here 
with a sin offering for the priest as it is for the nation. Um, a valuable bull is killed. If we go on and st- go on, and you can see in the verses below this without taking time to read all of these verses again. Um, the blood is sprinkled inside the veil in the holy place. There's blood put on the altar of incense. And then the rest of the blood is poured out around the base of the altar of burnt offering. The fat was burned with fire and offered to the Lord as a smooth, a soothing aroma. Um, and everything else was taken outside and burned outside the camp. However, in verse 15, we pick up a, a significant difference. Look at verse 15 with me. Then the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be slain before the Lord. So here we start to pick up a major difference. Here we see the elders of the nation of Israel were to lay their hands on this innocent substitutionary sacrifice as they represent the nation. So here the elders are representing God's people. They are to come lay all of their hands on this innocent bull. Again, it's a very high-priced animal Um, very similar to what the priest did. But now you have not the priest laying his hands on it, you have the elders of the nation laying their hands on this innocent animal. And the idea here was the leadership of the nation was not merely just to touch the bull, but but more the spiritual idea, and and here's, uh, Spurgeon does a great job with his sermon on it, but I won't read all his quotes, he said, they were to lean on that animal. Whoa. That starts to hit home, doesn't it? Man, do we still lean on Jesus that way? I forgave my sins back in 1970. I'm just kind of going through life. I repent it once. I don't need to repent of other things. So, see that callousness towards the Lord? Boy, I began to look at this a little more deeply. And the more I read this and followed out some different passages, it, it gave this understanding that this action that these elders were to take stressed this nature of faith to believe in this substitute. This wasn't ritual for them. It wasn't never meant to be ritual. It was certainly pointing to a greater sacrifice someday. There's types and symbolic here of coming the Lord Jesus Christ. But in this day, before there was a Christ on the earth, they were to lean on this animal by faith that it would cover their sins of this nation. And they believed it. And they believed this animal would bear its burden. It would bear the sin. It would bear the guilt. And it would remind them of the heaviness of sin against a holy God. Can you imagine that? These these elders, I don't know how many there were. We see quite a few um, mentioned as time goes on. uh, Moses is adding elders I don't know how many of these are, and if maybe they had to take rotations of just get, you know, going inside the door of the tent, and there, hand after hand after hand after hand after hand of the leadership of the nation leaning on this innocent bull to take the sin of this nation and to atone for it. Truly, this was an act of confession that was to display true repentance of the nation's rejection of God's truth. And the leadership was held in responsibility for that in some way, right? They're they're held in responsibility for the care of God's children. Now, of course, the Catholic Church, and and one of the things when you study Catholicism, you begin to understand they never left the Old Testament. They never understood biblical theology. And so you see where the Catholic Church to this day robs Christ, robs God's word of authority, and they remain the authority and those who bear control over God's church. And it's because they reject Jesus Christ as the ultimate sacrifice. And so the Catholic Church just goes south over and over and over and over and over and over many places. But that's not what was really being taught here. What was taught here was it was to assure the leadership of the nation that if they came with true right hearts, that this that this substitute would, would take that sin, atone for that sin, at least for them time till they have to come back again, would atone for it. And it taught them. You know, think about this. It taught them the grace of God. Remember, the law is being taught to them. 
And the law tells them that if they continue in sin, they'll die. If they continue in sin, he'll send their enemies to come wipe them out. They heard this over and over as Moses taught this. And so as they lay the hands on them, they don't want that. They've already been to Egypt. They've already seen what that is. They lay it on and say, oh God, be gracious to us. We're leaning on you for grace and forgiveness of our sins. And again, I mean, you and I know there's such a bigger picture here, isn't it? It's Jesus. And, and brothers and sisters, I, I know at salvation, you leaned on Jesus. You put your whole hope and faith in the Lord Jesus for salvation. But do we today lean on him daily? You see, if you don't, you never deal with sin. You just sweep it under the rug and you move on. And so you live in unresolved sin, you live in unresolved conflict, and you just keep going. Because we don't, as Christians, we don't lean on Jesus Christ like we should. Drop all the way down to verse 20 just for the sake of time. There, there are some repetition of things that go on just like the priest had to do here. But look, notice right at the end of verse 20, look at this. Um, let me just read the first whole verse. And he shall also do with the bull, just as he did with the bull and the sin offering. Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atonement for them. And look at this little phrase. And they, what? Will be forgiven. It was temporary. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't forever. It was going to have to happen again and again and again and again. And that's just why the writer of Hebrews says... The blood of bulls and calves can never take away sin permanently. So Christ came to do all that. But but at least for that moment, can you imagine our God who brought us out of Egypt has forgiven us for our unintentional, for for our lack of faithfulness to him during this time. I found that very comforting. Any biblical leadership, whether in church, listen, or at home, or on the job, should display this kind of dependency on the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We should do that as leaders in our homes, on our jobs, in the church, wherever that may be. Men, God calls us to be leaders. I want you to look at Psalms 65. There's a passage we looked at in our staff devotional. I just want to look at the first ones because I think David just totally believed this. (laughs) He... I think he truly repented of his sin and he knew that he couldn't handle his sin. We looked at this whole psalm on Tuesday as a staff and we just worshipped the Lord of his grace and mercy and his, his righteousness and how he has control of all things. But I just want to look at the verse four verses here with you. David writing this at some point in his life, we're not sure when, um, says, there will be silence before you. Well, I like that little phrase. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. In a sense, every mouth will be closed before God. What are you going to tell him when you get in front of him as a lost person? Praise in Zion, O God. And he goes on to say, and to, to you, the vow has been performed. We, we praise you, God. This is what we do when we come into your presence. Then he says in verse 2, what confidence, what encouragement he has here. He says, oh, you who hear prayer. Remember, they're surrounded by the Philistines and Moab and Hittites and Prezerites, and they're all bowing down for their gods who are stone and rock and can't hear nothing, right? And we have a psalm that we we have in the Bible, and it's again repeated, I think, in one of the major prophets, but they, they have idols, and they have, they have ears, but they cannot hear, they have mouths, but they cannot speak, and so forth, right? But not David. He says, you're not like them. You hear prayer. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? What an amazing relationship David had with God because he walked with him in a consistent way. Then look at this, verse 3. Boy, this is, really hits home. Iniquities prevail against me. You know what I think he's saying? I can't beat my sin on my own. I, left to myself, have no recourses. I don't have the ability. It comes over me like a wave. But look at how he responds to this. As for our transgressions, look at this. You forgive them. You leave me to my own iniquity, I'm going to get pummeled like a wave out of the ocean. To my transgressions, you forgive them. 
David said in Psalms 32, blessed is the man whose transgressions have been forgiven. As he worshipped that God had forgiven him for the sin, great sins. You know, Bathsheba, death of her husband, lying to the nation. I mean, all those things. And then he just finally turns to praise, how blessed is the one whom you chose. You think doctrines of grace are only in the New Testament? I mean, the truth of God's sovereignty and salvation is all through the Bible. How blessed is the one whom you chose. And look at this, and bring near to you. I mean, that's Ephesians 1. He knows that he's blissfully joyful is the idea that God chose him from the foundations of the world and has brought him near to him. And look at this, he's like a priest. He dwells in your courts. Now, certainly we believe in the priesthood of the the priest of a believer's New Testament, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where this royal priesthood and, and come into the presence of God. We weren't a people, now we are a people. We didn't have mercy, and now we have mercy, and so forth. But here, listen to this. He says, we dwell in your courts. We're in your presence. And look at this. We will be satisfied with your goodness of your house and your holy temple. That's a forgiven person. That's a forgiven person. And this sin offering, this whole thing is teaching us that we lean upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that, that bull is taken away. And here, particularly, Jesus Christ is taken away and he's offered on our behalf. We come nothing. We get nothing out of this in the fact that we take something away or, or we brought something. We come empty-handed, laying, leaning on his finished work. And we find, like David said, many years before the cross, he found himself forgiven and enjoying the courts of God. J.C. Ryle said, many people don't want to go to heaven. Many people won't like heaven because they've never liked God here. So why will you like him there? You've never had joy with him here. You fought him every day here on earth. You wouldn't believe him. You didn't study his word. You didn't submit to him. So why do you think heaven is for you? See, forgiven people, adulterers, murderers, liars, who receive the forgiveness of Christ because we lean wholly on him, dwell in his courts. Do you find comfort in that? I know we're a little light tonight, but can you give me an amen on that? I mean, I am, that gets me excited. I'm forgiven. And I can enjoy Jesus. I can enjoy God. Stop being afraid of him. He's your Abba Father. He has forgiven you. Oh, I got two more to get through here real quick. Um, four, the sin offering of the leadership of Israel. Go back to Leviticus chapter four. You see why I'm only getting through one chapter at a time here. My whole goal was to take on four or five, and then I get studying and I go, oh, there's so much in here. There's so much in here to unpack. Number four, the uh, sin offering of the leadership of Israel. Right? So we've done priesthood, we've done the nation, now the leaders who came to lay their hands upon this bull for the sins of the nation, now he's going to deal with them, verses 22 through 26. Look at verse 22 with me. When the leader sins and unintentionally does any one of all of those things the Lord his God has commanded him not to do, he becomes guilty. If he sins in which he has committed, um, committed is made known to him, he shall bring of his offering a goat, a male, without defect. Now here the word, the Hebrew word for leader is nasa, is the, I think the way you pronounce it there. And it's, and it's found sometimes of political leaders, um, the Jews used it for kings, but Abraham spoke of it as he being the leader of his family. So it's a word that has a little bit of wide range, and it's anyone who has been God, has been given, God has given leadership to. So in the sin offering for the leadership, the procedure is very similar, yet there are some great distinctions between the offering of the priest or the nation here. Verse 23, we first, uh, there first must be an understanding of a sin. Notice he says if he comes to the understanding of this, if the sin which he has committed is made known to him. So now he has knowledge of it. And listen, no one confesses or repents of sin unless <laughs> they understand what they did. And, and that's the process of, 
of counseling sometimes. That's the process of loving a friend or a spouse or whatever it be. You, you work through to help them understand why they have sinned and where that sin came from and what that sin was and, and how it's an acknowledgement and a, and a somewhat of a rejection even of who God is. So they have to come to that understanding. And I think all God's true children who become aware of their sins are responsible to confess and repent of it. Confess, Lord, I did this. Repent, I'm turning from it and I'm going to go the other direction by your grace and mercy. Right? This is, this is what this is saying here. So for us in the new covenant believers, we look to the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment, and that becomes our motivation to this day, even as believers of many years, some of us in here, to still confess our sins and still repent of it. Because the cross isn't foolish to you like it is to the Gentiles. The cross isn't a stumbling block like it is to the Jews. The cross is everything to us, right? And it motivates us to certainly repent. Now, notice in verse 23, these leaders are to bring a male unblemished goat or lamb. The Hebrew word is the same. You, it's hard to distinguish between what we would think a goat and a lamb um, as a substitutionary sacrifice here. Now, clearly, this was a lesser animal as far as cost, right? You got a bull, a up to 2,000 pound bull that pulls all kinds of stuff. It's very valuable. It's expensive. And now you have um, a young lamb here, a young male ram here to be given instead. Well, first I believe this was done to show that God uh, definitely accounts for sin individually. So the leaders were not exempt, right? Uh, he, he sees that this needs to be done. The bulls were done for the for the priest, and the bulls were done for the entire nation. But now individually, for these leaders, they're not above, above sacrificial system here. They're not above repentance, confession and repentance. Second, I believe it also dem demonstrates that the leader was not greater than God. Um, he comes in a humble way, bringing a humble lamb before him. God, I am I'm underneath you. I need you. I need to come to you. I need to lean on this animal because I need your forgiveness. Now, just as in all the other offerings, as you look at these, the leader's hands to be placed on the substitutionary sacrifice, and the animal is killed right in front of him, and the blood is drained. However, now, as you go down and read this, the blood never comes into the tabernacle. Now, the first two, the priest and, and for the nation, that blood goes into the tabernacle, but not the blood of this leader, I mean, of this leader's sacrifice. The blood never comes into the altar. It doesn't get put on the altar of incense that the high priest did. Instead, it's offered outside of that. The blood was wiped on the horns of the altar. You'll see the burnt off offering that's just inside the doorway of the tent of meetings. And the rest of it, the rest of that blood was poured out around the altar. Now, this may point out the leader's sin in in a couple of ways, in that, one, it, it affects the camp. But here's why I think it's done. I think God wanted the leaders sacrifice, the substitutionary sacrifice for them, and all of this done where it could be seen publicly. With the priests, um, those ones who came for God, he wanted them to know that he did not want them not to be able to come into his presence and be able to pray and to offer to him. For the nation, it was a large group of people. It was a group of people that were seeking forgiveness for unintentional sin. But now for these leaders, it was to be publicly shown. It was not to be behind the veil. It was to be where people could actually see. And again, the fat of the offering would be burned up and the smoke would be lifted up to God, just like the peace offering. And the meat would be shared, now differently, would be shared with the priest. But the rest of the sacrifice was to be taken and burned outside the camp according to Leviticus 6, 24 through 30. It doesn't say it all there, but in that chapter it tells us. There's one more here that I just want to finish with. Um, number five, the sin offering for the individual Israelite. This starts in verse 27 and works its way down through 35. And the procedure was the same for the leader in some ways, but there's one major exception here. It says that they can bring a female goat or lamb could be offered instead of a male goat or lamb. And automatically, if you're a good student of the Bible, you go, okay, why now the female? 
Why is a female goat or lamb brought? And, and isn't Christ supposed to be best typified by the male lamb? Now remember, this is an atonement. This is, this is individual sins of negligence that God's bringing. Um, so keep that in mind here as well. But here, here's, some, here's some thoughts. This, I read so many, I read everybody I could find on this, trying to see what other people thought on this. But I finally just pinned down some things that I think what the Lord is doing here. So take this as my commentary here. It's possible that God intended that occasionally taking a female substitution, substitutionary sacrifice in front of a, like a female lamb here would keep Israel from supposing that atonement was not equal between men and women. So maybe, maybe, this is my thoughts. I'm, getting, I'm telling you my thoughts here. Because in a male-dominant world in the Old Testament, which seems to be that way, I don't think it's near as much as you think it is. The more you study, the more you realize he makes atonement for all people, um, even in the sacrificial system. Um, but it seems to be that way, so that, that possibly could be it. Both male and female children of God are to imitate the sacrifice of, of the life of the animal, in a way, right? So in the New Testament, let me see if I can put this... The New Testament doesn't make a difference between men and women. We're all supposed to be imitators of Christ. Walk as Christ walked, right? Obey him. And so there's no distinction. And I think that was true under the law. It wasn't like, okay, men, you walk one way, and women, you walk a different way. And so I think this brings some of that understanding that all of God's children were to imitate. And like that lamb, they were to live sacrificial lives, just like Jesus died and, le- and had a sacrificial life, we are to live sacrificially, right? Now, another thought, as I believe the sacrifice of the female goat or lamb displayed a need for atonement for some of the smallest offense. Sometimes you think about a bull and the cost of that, right? And all that, oh, that's a big deal, right? And then you got a female lamb, which is probably the cheapest of any offering right here. The, the ram would be more because he can reproduce and and, and, and breed lots of female uh, rams or go, uh, goats or lambs. Um, uh, and so there's a different cost, right? It's even to this day when you sell cattle, steers, and bull calves always bring a better, higher price just because they gain weight more and so forth like that. So this is a, this is a little more ex- inexpensive sacrifice here. So here's what I thought. Whether you're a housewife or whether you're a servant or whether you're the least of the brethren... All sins need to be atoned for no matter what your social or economic status was. And so I think God said, even with you're on that end of it, bring me a female lamb and I will forgive your sins. And it made it available for that. We'll go on as we go on and look at other sacrifices. There's times where they can bring even less than this. They can bring turtle doves and so forth. Now, one more thought on this female goat or lamb would certainly be this cost-effectiveness. And I think just God was gracious to the nation. And he just gives them the opportunity to be able to handle what he asks of them. He doesn't ask for us to give a million dollars. He asks us to give a portion back of what he's given to us. This is the way God works. Now, after the individual Israelite, he's laid his hands, and again, you can read all this, I'm skipping through this, but giving you the highlights of it. After this individual Israelite, male or female, lays his hands or her hands on the head of this sin offering, they are now identifying with their sins onto this individual sacrifice. So this is very personal. And the blood only went to the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and was poured around the altar. And again, the blood's not brought into the tabernacle, but kept very public here. Because again, now we come to this act of faith that God would atone their sins. Here's what Spurgeon said on this. He said, sometimes, according to the rabbis, those who brought the victim, that would be the sacrifice, the female lamb or the bull or whatever it means, leaned with all their might on it. And they pressed on it as though they seemed to say, I am acting I am showing that all I put all of my burden, I put all of my weight, I put all of my force of sin on this unblemished victim. Spurgeon goes on to say this. He says, Oh, my soul, lean hard on Christ. Throw all your weight upon him, for he is able to bear it and came on purpose to bear it. So I thought, thinking about this, I thought about that dear widow, you know, in Israel. And maybe she's in line on the offering of the sin offering back there, and the 
priests are up there offering these bulls, these expensive animals. They're large and take time to get slaughtered and handled. And she's in line and she's back there with this little female goat. It's unblemished. She brought her best that she had and she waits in line. And as she finally gets there, this woman who maybe has no husband, she maybe does not have a lot, she leans on that in faith. And God forgives her. Isn't that beautiful? And, and that's what God does. And when you look at the diversity of the church, just the people in this room, just the diversity in this, this room, diversity of our church, let alone the church around the world, how diverse it is. I have the pleasure of traveling and seeing people in places that you just can't imagine as an American who are believers in what they live in. And, they, and they're believers, and when you spend time with them, you realize they leaned on Jesus Christ in their third world, terrible life, abuse beyond what you can imagine here in America, and they love Jesus and they're full of joy. And then we have people here who have been given so much and they call themselves Christians. And they say they lean on Christ, but they're miserable. They, they, they have no joy. They fight what God tells them to do. And Do you lean on Christ? Is He everything to you? I, I just, when I studied this, I thought, Lord, you're so gracious. Wages of sin is death, but you provided a way, and you're showing a picture of so much greater. And, and we, and with our biblical theology, we now know all of this blood and all this leaning, all these types and all these symbols are a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, and it causes us to rejoice in his atoning work, doesn't it? Do you confess and repent of sin regularly? Regularly. Do you confess your sins to one another? See, they had to do all of this. You and I can sit at a stoplight and close our eyes and say, God, the things that came out of my mouth were godless. Your son died for that. Will you forgive me? It's grace upon grace, isn't it? What are we doing with that grace. Well, just to finish up, verse 35 is much like the peace offering. He said they should remove the fat, and the fat of the lamb shall be removed, and the sacrifice, just like the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall offer it up and smoke on the altar, and the offering by fire of the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regards to his sin, which he committed. And look at this again in this phrase, and he will be forgiven. And so this offering takes place and this one who came in faith, who believed in this, this innocent substitutionary sacrifice was forgiven. It's true today. Confess and repent of our sins. Not to gain prosperity, not to get in God's favor. If we are a child of God, you already have his favor. He's got a place set for you at his table. But so you walk in fellowship, and listen to this. You, maybe you've got out of fellowship. We use terms like this to try to explain this. Maybe you've got out of fellowship with Christ because you've lived in unintentional and tensional sin. <laughs> I want to say because I don't want to try to dismiss that. Do you want to be back in fellowship with God? Confess your sins. Name them and turn from them. See, anything else is just filthy rags. You come and say, well... Yeah, I'm never going to deal with that. I'm not going to deal with that sin. It's in the past. God, Jesus died for it. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. It's, you, you come in false worship. God wants you to be right with him. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. I'll close with two verses. For Christ also died for sin once and for all. And listen to this. The just for the unjust. Can you see that with that bull right there, or that little lamb? He, he didn't do anything. That little female lamb didn't do anything. He was just born on the Sinai plain out there. He's just. He's right. It's the unjust. It's the unrighteous that lay the hands on that and weigh onto that. And that just one dies for the unjust. And see, God planned this from the foundations of the world, First Peter goes on to say, so that we might bring, he might bring us to God. He brings us to God. 
having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He, was, he didn't die um, in his spirit. He died in flesh, right? For us, his wages, wages of our sin killed him. But then the last verse that just has to be read. You know this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels, controls, motivates. There's a great word there for that Greek word. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he who died for all, so that, here we go, they who live, you didn't die because you leaned on the Lord Jesus Christ and he forgave you of your sin. They who live might no longer live for what? Themselves. But for him who died and rose again for us. So I believe this sin offering was God's graciousness. And as that person turned away, as he stood there or she stood there and she watched the lifeblood come out of that lamb or that, or that bull and, and they offered it before God, as they watched that process happen, they were able to walk away and say, Oh God, I don't want to sin. Cause me to see your grace in this and walk with you. I think they could do that in the Old Testament and I think people did it and I think David did it. But you and I here, now on the other side of the cross... Oh, we look back and say, oh, Jesus, you died for me. Help me live for you. Right? Amen? Father, thank you. It's been good to study this. Um, I'm afraid, Lord, our churches are losing the understanding of the Old Testament. I'm afraid so many don't understand or study or pastors are not studying and teaching the great truths of the Old Testament because they all flow to this testimony of you, of your son. But even in this, this is grace. This is grace given. It's an adulterated grace given to these people who lean by faith on the head of this animal. And they didn't receive the wages of their sin. They received life. And yet they had to do it over and over again. But Jesus, you came and you put an end to all that. You completed the first and you brought in the new covenant. And we find grace and mercy constantly now before the throne of God because what Jesus has done. And so, Lord, help us live that way. Help us live in light of the cross, Lord. And a resurrected Jesus Christ who beat our sin publicly, proclaiming sin is done. I beat it for Scott. Let him live for me. Lord, let us be challenged by this tonight. and Let us be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen.